down the seating chart. Keep in mind, okay, it looks like this. That's upside down. The front's down here, right? So the front spot is actually this guy right here. So pay attention to what seat you have in front of you. If you don't know what you are, like if you look right here, there's a number in front of each of the chairs, and these are all numbered on here. So just write your number, your name in the correct number spot. In this year, <coughs> 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 yes. Yeah, it's it's all right, so some of the upcoming assignments that we have, um, and I need everybody's attention now. Um, we got the hydrate lab at, that's due today. Um, you're going to get a worksheet on molecular and empirical formulas. That's going to be due tomorrow. Um, we'll talk about that briefly today. And um, we have a chemical formula review that's going to be due Friday because our chemical formulas test is on Friday. So the majority of today's class period is going to be dedicated to reviewing each of the types of problems that we can see on that test. Okay, we're going to go through um, a hydrate lab question to start out with just so we all know how to do um, the lab questions because you can expect there to be lab type material questions on the test. So we should know how to take care of some of those. So we're going to look at um, just one of those today. Okay, so um, before we actually do this problem, I just want to talk about the post lab for a minute here. If we take a look at number three in the post lab, number three on your post lab is asking you to determine if the, the following things that could happen in the lab, <coughs> the things listed, would affect the number of <coughs> moles or that ratio that you get for your for your water. So for example, like you know, if you got the a six to a one ratio, you got a three to one ratio, whatever. Um, it, it's asking you if that would affect those ratios, okay, and how it would affect them. So it's either saying would it be higher or lower, or would there be no change? So when we're um, when we're looking at, we we should be thinking about what's happening to our data in order to answer those questions correctly, right? So um, that first one is saying that after you heat the hydrate. It's saying that there's black soot left in the bottom of the crucible. So just to, I'm just going to use simple numbers to illustrate like what would be happening here so you can kind of see how you'd be thinking about it. So if we look at our data up there, the way that we found um, the mass of the, of the water was taking the mass of the crucible cover and sodium carbonate hydrate minus the mass of the crucible cover and strontium er, chloride. And, uh, what did it say sodium carbonate? It should say strontium chloride. Okay, and strontium chloride. Okay, so if we take a look here. Um, it's, it's the second one minus the third one anyway. So if we just use made up data right now. So if we, have, if we say that we have the mass of the crucible and the hydrate, and I'm writing less obviously to save some time here. But let's say that equal 23 grams. So after we took and we put some of the hydrate in there, we took, you know, we were supposed to put five grams. After we put that in there, let's say it weighed 23 grams. Okay, and then we found the mass of our crucible and just the either copper sulfate or magnesium sulfate, right? And so all the only difference here is that there's no water anymore, right? After you heat it. You guys are with me so far. So if we did this correctly and there was nothing on the bottom, our data might be something like, I don't know, 21.5, okay? Which would tell us that we had 1.5 grams of water. Everybody can see that right now, right? Like that, that's what we're, we're subtracting here. Now, what this is asking you is what would happen if there was something wrong? What would happen if some black soot got left in the bottom of the crucible? Well, that's gonna raise the number of grams that we would get for this at the end here, right? Like there's extra stuff on the bottom of the crucible. So let's just say there's enough that now it raised our value by, I don't know, 0.5. So now I would say this time we weigh it, we actually got 22 grams instead of the 21.5 that we were actually supposed to get because we can't really see the water being gone here, right? So what did that do? Now we only have 
Now if we took our data, we would only have one gram of water, right? So we actually found that we had less water here if we, if we didn't have a clean crucible, right? So would that affect our value for x by being too high or too low then? That's what we should be thinking about here, and it would make it too low, okay? Because you're going to have less grams, therefore less moles, therefore when you do your ratio, you're going to have a smaller ri ratio. So it might be a 1 to 2 instead of 1 to 3 or whatever. Everybody follow me so far on that? Like that's how you should be approaching these questions on there. So they shouldn't just be like guessing questions. Like think about what's actually happening to the data when those things are happening there. So you have, I don't know, like four other ones. And if you're looking at one and you're like, well, I don't think that would affect the data at all, it's probably no change, right? <coughs> okay, so that's the post lab. That's all we're going to be doing with that. So um, you can finish it up and um, we do have spots up front where you can turn those in. We probably will have about 15 minutes of work time at the end of class today, so you can turn it in during that time. All right, now we're going to focus on this problem here. Um, the problem says all we want to do is find X from the hydrate data. So I have some made up hydrate data here. Okay, and what I would like to do here um, is I need to find out how many waters this strontium chloride can hold from the data. Okay, in order to do that, I'm going to have to compare the mole ratio or the moles of strontium chloride to the moles of water, just like we did in our lab, right? So in order to do that, we have to find out what our grams of strontium chloride is from our data and what our grams of water were that we evaporated away from this data up here. So first of all, we just talked about it. We know that to find grams of water, we take the mass of the crucible and everything with the hydrate minus the mass of the crucible and everything without the water in it anymore. Right? And that'll tell us how much. So we take 22.41 minus the 21.05. And as I'm going through these today, like, you can be kind of working along with me too or a little bit ahead of me to see if you're doing these right. Because it's going to be a really good gauge of where you're at for Friday right now. Okay? So we take this and we're going to get 1.36 grams. Is everybody good with like where I'm getting these numbers from right now? Yes, I'm just taking it from our data table up here. Okay. So remember that that's our mass of our crucible and cover, and that's our and hydrate, and this is the mass of it without the water. Okay, so we find out we have 1.36 grams of water. Now, we have to figure out how much the mass or what the mass of the strontium chloride is here. So we can't get this confused. The middle part of the table here, the mass of the crucible cover and sodium carbonate hydrate. That's with water, right? The 22.41 is with the water. So that doesn't tell us how much the strontium chloride weighs. That tells us how much the hydrate weighs. The one that tells us how much the strontium chloride weighs is going to be the bottom one minus the top, minus the mass of the crucible and cover. Okay, so we're going to take 21.05 minus 17.55. And we're going to get 3.5 grams of strontium chloride. Okay, now this should be looking familiar. We know we've done this quite a few times. We have grams of each of these. Whenever we're doing something in chemistry like this, we want to be able to compare the moles. And when we're talking about formulas, all that a formula is, is it's a ratio between moles of the compounds. Okay, and it's a whole number ratio. So right now we're going to figure out exactly what that ratio is between waters and strontium chlorides. In order to do that, we have to set up a T-chart that gets us to moles of each of these. So I want to end up with moles of strontium chloride, and I want to end up with moles of H2O here, because I need to compare those ratios. <coughs> In order to do that, what do I need to put on the bottom, or what's the name of the value that has to go down here? Right here. How can I find this? Yeah, the molar mass, right? The molar mass in the periodic table. So I have to find out what the molar mass of H2O is, and I have to find out what the molar mass of the strontium chloride is. Okay, so I'm going to use the periodic table to do that. For water, it's just 18 grams. And then for strontium chloride, I have to look up strontium. I have to look up chlorine. 
I had to add them together. If I do that, I'm going to get 158.53 grams. Now, at this point, if I divide these out both by their molar masses, that is going to tell me how many moles of each I have. <coughs> so, if I do this, I'm going to get 0 0.022 moles of strontium chloride. Okay, and for water, I'm going to get about 0 0.075. Now, what is the next step here? Do we remember? Divide by the smallest. Divide by the smallest. Right. We divide by the smallest, so we're going to divide by the point zero two two. Divide the bottom one by point zero two two. Remember, that's just going to make sure that we get at least one. That's that's a whole number. One that's one, right? Always, every time. Then. Okay, so we're going to get one. And then for the water, we get about 3.4. Now, do we need to multiply that 3.4 by a whole number to get the whole number ratios right now? No, not for lab data. Remember, that's what we, it's, it's kind of a trick question there. Like not for lab data, we don't. If we were doing one where we're asking for an empirical formula here, where I'm trying to find out, like, not exactly how many water molecules I have, but like what the formula of a compound is, I would need to do that. But right now, I'm trying to find how many water molecules I have here. I'm trying to use lab data. Okay, so it's not going to be perfect, right? We're assuming that we have some error here. Okay, that's what's happening. So what we're actually going to do is round this to the nearest whole number. Now, I know it's like, we would assume if we had something like this, that it's probably like a relatively large percent error. Okay, if like something that's in the middle like this. Okay, but the whole the nearest whole number that we would have here is 3. Okay, so the, the problem is asking us to solve for x. We'd say x is 3, or we would say that the formula for this compound would be it's strontium chloride, and then we have 3 H2Os. Or we say strontium chloride trihydrate. <coughs> Does anybody have questions on this one? Like on how to use the data. Like it, the, the most important part, you guys, when you get a problem like this, is finding out how many grams of the two things that you're working with first are, okay, from the data. And then I think most of us can probably solve it from there, right? But like working our way through the data is probably the most challenging part. So we want to try and isolate um, the pieces that we're asked for, okay? Now, um, the next one we're going to do deals with percent composition. So we're going to go through each other type of problem that we might encounter on the test now. So we're, like, we're literally going to see all of them that we could potentially have. All right, so this guy says, um, what is the percent composition of C6H5NH2. So remember, this is what we did the very first thing when we started this chapter out. Okay, so we what we want to know is what percent of this compound is carbon, what percent of this compound will be hydrogen, and what percent of this compound will be made up of nitrogen. So when we did these, remember the first thing is we have to total up how many of each atom we have and then multiply by their individual molar masses. Okay, so we have carbon. And there's six. We have hydrogen, and we have in two spots. There's a five, and there's two, so we got seven. And we got nitrogen, and there's only one of those. Okay. In this first step here, all we are doing 
is multiplying all and finding the molar mass here, which I think most of us know how to do. Okay, so we take six, we're gonna times twelve point zero one one. Numbers coming from the periodic table, right? And we get seventy two point zero six six. Okay, so that's the mass that carbon's contributing to this compound. Okay, then we would take hydrogen, it's at seven times one point zero zero seven nine. Find that hydrogen contributes 7.055, and then nitrogen is 1 times 14.007, and so nitrogen is just contributing 14.077. Okay? Now, those are the individual masses that each of those are. All right, adding to this. So, when we add them all together, that's going to tell us the total molar mass of this compound. Okay, so we had 72.066 plus 7.055 plus 14.077. And we're going to get 93.128, and that's grams per mole. <coughs> okay. Now, remember, when we're doing percentages here, we, we want to find the percent. We have to divide the total, or sorry, the part divided by the whole. Okay, so we know that carbon is contributing 72.066 grams, so it's divided by the 93.128. And then, of course, if we want to find the percentage, we can multiply by 100. So each of these is going to get divided by that total molar mass here, and then times by 100 to find a percentage. Remember, we have to divide each part by that total. Okay? So, we would find out that this compound in particular is 77.1% carbon. Um, it is, hold on, I forget exactly what it was, 7.8% hydrogen. about 15.1% nitrogen. Questions on that guy? empirical formulas. Okay, so, um, and what I mean is we're solving for empirical formulas. Whenever we talk about empirical and molecular formulas, we're probably going to be talking about um, both of them in, in a lot of these problems, right? But when I, there's some reason it says empirical formulas up here is because that's the one that we're being asked to solve for right now. And we have to have some knowledge about what an empirical formula is and what a molecular formula is. So first of all, we look at the problem, it says, if a compound's molecular formula is C15H21O6, what is its empirical formula? So we know the molecular is C15H21O6. And we want to know what the empirical is. Um, we need to remember that an empirical formula is always a smallest whole number ratio. Okay, that's very important. So if it's not the smallest whole number ratio, those can be it's not an empirical formula. Okay, it's a molecular formula. Though. Okay, they could be the same, but they don't have to be. <coughs> so this type of problem here, it really is the uh, the easiest probably type of problem that you could have from this unit because. All we need to do is find the smallest whole number ratio that these can be together. Okay, and so it's as simple as just basically reducing this down, right, as far as we can. So we just want to divide it, you know, by a common multiple here if we can. Okay? So we're, all we're going to do is divide them all by three. three. Right. So we'd end up with C5 
H7, and O2. Okay, so like I said, that's an, that's an easy type of problem. Now the next type of problem we're going to do is a, it, we're finding empirical formula again, but this is going to be <coughs> one that's exactly like the plane crash activity. Okay, so um, we're going to be given, well I guess not exactly because we're not given percentages, but we're going to be given some values and we're going to be asked to um, basically find that smallest whole number ratio, find that empirical formula. Okay, so this one says, um, an ibuprofen tablet contains 0.1513 grams of carbon, 0 0.0176 grams of hydrogen, and 0 0.0310 grams of oxygen. I want to know what the empirical formula for ibuprofen is. Okay, so some people, like, in the past, when they get a problem like this, <coughs> they've tried to basically find out what the percentage is here of each one. Right, like so I don't know what they do. They, right? they add like 0 0.1513 plus 0 0.0176 plus 0 0.0310, and they start dividing and finding percentages and all stuff. Okay, the whole the whole reason we take percentages and change them to grams is because we want things to be in grams, right? If they're already in grams, we don't need percentages at all. Okay, so if you get a problem like this where you're given grams for carbon, grams for hydrogen, grams for oxygen, or whatever we're dealing with, you just immediately start finding the smallest whole number ratio. So the first step that we do here is literally just solving for moles. Like we don't need to try and worry about percentages at all here. Okay, so literally you get 0.1513 grams of carbon, so you just write 0.1513 grams of carbon. Okay, and you're gonna do set up a T chart and try to get that to moles of carbon. Okay, and you're gonna do the same thing for hydrogen. So you, for hydrogen, you have 0.0176 grams hydrogen. Okay, you're gonna set up a T chart, divide by molar mass. We're trying to get to moles here. Okay, same thing for oxygen. You have oxygen is 0 0.0310. Set so up the T-chart. Bam, and you're going to divide by the molar mass for each of those. <coughs> okay, so, like I said, for this one, trying to get to moles carbon. Okay, so... We're going to divide by that molar mass. It's 12.011 grams. Okay, for hydrogen, 1.0079. For oxygen, we got 15.999. Okay, so all we're doing, once again, is getting those all into moles. Okay, so for this top one for carbon, you're going to get 0 0.01260, 0, um, and that's moles. Okay, for hydrogen, you're going to get 0 0.01746, 0 0.01747, 0 0.01748, and then for oxygen, you get 0 0.00194. Okay, next thing here, just like we did before with the hydrate, we divide by the smallest. Okay, so the smallest one here is going to be oxygen, it's 0 0.00194. So we divide 0 0.00194, obviously for oxygen we get one, for hydrogen, and for carbon. Alright, so if we do this, punch these in your calculator for hydrogen, then you get 9. And for carbon, we're going to get 6.5. Or about, it's actually 6.49. But if it's 6.49, that's close enough to assume that we're working with a half here, right? We're working with 0.5. So 
Now in this case, because we're trying to find the chemical formula compound and it's a problem like this, we need to multiply by whole a whole number, right? And for this case, we'd multiply by two, right? If we multiply one by two, we still have to preserve the ratio. I mean, this is still a ratio here, right? One to nine to 6.5, it's still a ratio, but we can't have 6.5 of a carbon. That's the whole reason we do this here, okay? So we multiply one by two, and we gotta multiply all of them by two. Okay, and we would get for a chemical formula here, C, 13, H, 18, O, 2. Questions on that one? Beautiful. <coughs> All right. Last two problems here, then we'll get some time to um, work on our homework for today. We're going to be asked to solve for molecular formulas here now. Um, a molecular formula is not the same as an empirical formula, right? It doesn't have to be the smallest whole number ratio. But a molecular formula is always going to be some multiple <coughs> of an empirical formula. Does that make sense? Like, it's just uh, an empirical formula multiplied by either, you know, two, three, could be one even. Um, but we have to figure out what that multiple is. So here it says a compound has an empirical formula of C4H5ON2. So Right away, we know that the empirical formula equals C4H5ON2, okay? Now, it says that this compound, not the empirical formula's molar mass, but the compound's molar mass is 291.25. So, the molar mass... Or we can think of this as the molecular mass equals 291.25. What we want to know is what's the molecular formula. So basically what's going to happen here, we need to know how much bigger this is than the mass of this. So we're going to end up taking the molecular formula divided by the empirical mass. And that's going to give us a number here. We'll take that number, multiply it through our compound to figure out what our formula is here. Okay, so the first thing we have to do here is figure out what's the molar mass of this. Okay, because we need to know how many times bigger this is than that. Okay, so we have to find. Uh, Carbons, okay, so we'll take uh, 4 <coughs> times 12.011, we take 5 times 1.0079, 1 times 15.999, and 2 times 14.007. Okay, so we get 48.044. <coughs> for the top, but all I'm doing is finding molar mass right now, right, of the empirical formula. That's it. Okay, so I think most of us probably uh, know how to do this. Um, then, for the hydrogen, we are going to get um, 5.040. For oxygen, obviously, it's still 15.999. And, yes, Taylor. And then for nitrogen, we have 28.014. We add these all together. We're going to get 
0.097 or 97.1 I guess is fine too, doesn't matter. Um, but that's going to be the mass of our empirical formula. So now that we know the molecular and we know the empirical, what we're going to do is take 291.25 divided by 97.1 and we're going to find out how much bigger the molecular is than the empirical. Okay, so it's going to be three times bigger. Now, what do we do with this three? Yes, Taylor? Exactly, we take this three and we're going to multiply it through the empirical formula. So I'm literally going to take, and it's like going like this, multiplying this all by three. So I'm going to get C12H15. O three and N six. That would be our molecular formula here. Questions? Sweet. All right. Last type of pro last problem type that we can have. It's also, the hardest problem type that we could have. <coughs> here, um, essentially what, what is going to end up having to happen here, we're going to end up having to solve for an empirical formula on this one and a molecular formula because we're not given either one. Okay, so on your test, this would be probably the most challenging type of problem that we would have. Okay, so the, the problem says um, a compound is, oh, sorry, there's typos on here. I, I forgot to tell you changes. So your numbers, might uh, the numbers are different on here. So your numbers should say 11.44%. Um, you can change them if you want. Uh, pho at phosphorus, and then it should say 88.56% bromine. And the molar mass should be 541 grams per mole. So you mean they're up there. You can see them. I'll just give you a second to change those. The compound is 11.44% phosphorus and 88.56% bromine. If the molar mass of the compound is 554, why am I saying that? 541 grams per mole, what is the molecular formula? Okay, so in this case, it's, it's a lot like the last problem, except we're not given an empirical formula to start with. So this is really combining all the different types of problems that we've been doing up to this point. Okay, so the first step that we have to do here is find out what's our empirical formula, okay, before we do anything else, because we don't have anything to compare to that molar mass up there, do we? So the first thing we would do is take those percentages and change them to grams, just like we were doing with plane crash, just like we do any time we get percentages like that, okay? So we're going to take 11.44% phosphorus. We're going to call that and say the compound is 11.44 grams of phosphorus, okay? And then... We're going to do the same thing with bromine. We'll say that it's 88.56 grams of bromine. And why don't you guys try the rest and get to the empirical formula part of this, okay? And then I'll show you how to move forward from there. So you guys work on the rest of this. So the, the, the next part here, you're trying to get the small small number ratios, and then I'll go through what those are in a second. I'll write it up. For you. Well, you guys can work on it. You can talk to somebody next to you. Thirty to eight. Thirty. Thirty point nine. Reach to thirty one. 
what you should have up to that point right now. <laughs> Is that what we're getting, people? PBR3, yes? Okay, so after that, what do I gotta do next? <laughs> yeah, so what's the molar mass of PBR3? Seventy point seven about. How do I do what? How do you get You do literally your spirit table do. Two seventy. Uh, phosphorus plus three times bromines. You didn't know that. Okay, so what do we get for the molar mass here? Somebody else. Two seventy point seven. Is that what everybody else is getting? Good. So we get. Well, the empirical formula's mass is 270.7 grams per mole. What do we do with this now? Somebody, raise your hand. Yeah, what are you doing? Divide the molar mass of compound by the 270.7. Exactly. We take 541, which is the molecular mass, okay? And it's grams per mole. Divided by 270. Point seven. That tells us that the molecular is how many times bigger? Two. two. So then all we do is multiply this by two. two. And we get P2BR6. Okay, so this would be our final answer here. So yes, it is a big problem. Okay, while we were doing that, Mr. Gussie passed out a homework sheet. I just want to get you started quick on number 12, and then you have the rest of the time to work. Um, 
Did everybody get them? Pass them down then, and I'll wait to start. <coughs> yeah, I can get them. All right, everybody got one now? Look at number 12 quick, please. 12 says we're dealing with indium chloride here, right? It, sa it says you have a certain amount of grams. Hold on. 12 says the sample of indium chloride weighing 0 0.500 grams is found to contain 0 0.2404 grams of chlorine. What is the empirical formula of the indium compound? So it's not telling you what the mass of indium is right now, right? So it's important to understand that when you're done, you have to have indium something, chlorine something. Okay, so you are getting a total mass of this compound that's 0 0.5000 grams. You know the mass of the chlorine is 0 0.2402 grams of that. Okay, so obviously in order to find the grams of indium here, we gotta take this guy minus this guy, okay, because it's not giving to you explicitly in the problem. Then, guys, now once you have the grams, you can go right into trying to find the smallest whole number ratios, okay? This is one of those ones you don't need to change the percents or anything, you already have grams, okay? All right, you already have the rest of the time to work. If you have questions while you're working right now, Please raise your hand and come around. All right, and we'll come around and answer questions for you.